Alright. Alright. Alright, there we go. All set up. Um, so, I guess before beginning, a uh, few quick notes. I know there was a question around the uh, oscilloscope probes and C102 and clips and stuff. I don't know if they finished. They were making more of the clips. Uh, basically, they didn't have probes for that room, they said. And they all the clips they had were in the room, so they were making more of them. I don't know, does anyone know if they put more in or not yet? No one's seen. Okay, anyway, that's in theory it should be coming. So hopefully you have the ability to use both channels, the oscilloscope at once. Um, if not, I don't know, you can talk to Mark to see to put the pressure on, but that's sort of the only uh, system. I also had a note, I had a few people, um, I think a lot of people figured this out, but with the motor drivers, uh, things weren't working and what was happening is the LED was just on all the time. In theory, the LED shouldn't be on all the time. Um, it, if there's a fault, it turns that LED on. Uh, the problem is that it latches it on uh, until you do certain things to the input. So it might be on and it just doesn't matter anymore because it was a very short fault. Um, but if the LED is on and your motor isn't moving, that might be a problem. Uh, so basically what we have here, there's this EF, this error flag. Um, and when that's low, the LED is on, indicating there's an error. So there's a thing down here that says zero equals error. Um, and basically there's a whole bunch of uh, conditions that can make it happen. So for example, if there's a short circuit uh, between the outputs, um, what's of particular interest to us is this last one, over temperature or under voltage. Uh, so the error flag will happen in uh, this under voltage condition. And so this means there's the input voltage is actually too low for the driver chip to function properly. So it flags an error. Uh, and what this is, is basically you have to look into the data sheet somewhere and it has under electrical characteristics, it has a whole bunch of stuff that says like, you know, maximum minus 0.3 to 7 volts and things like that, or some higher voltage. Um, but this is the critical one, the switch on uh, voltage. So basically what we have to have is um, at absolute maximum uh, it, or minimum it needs to be at least six volts uh, for that lockout to sort of, uh, in this case, they say the undervolt switch on, which means the system turns on. Um, so it says as the supply voltage is increasing, uh, it won't turn on until, in worst case, six volts. Uh, it might be, it says typically it's turning on around 5.3, but what this means is that if you power the system, the V plus rail by five volts, uh, it won't, it probably won't work. It might just work. So this is, this is the, um, the V plus. So this one needs to be greater than six volts. Uh, if you put it to five volts, it probably won't work. Unfortunately, you could be just on the edge of it working. So you think it works and then later in the competition, it doesn't work. Um, so this should basically go right to your batteries is the, the deal. Um, and then there is somewhere, so this is the connector uh, there is somewhere else a 5 volt in, so on one of the connectors there's this, and this has to be just plus 5 volts. So that the plus 5 volt is used for some of the input uh, stuff. But basically that's what, I had a few people get cut off by that. Um, so just some 6 to 9 volts in this case, so direct from your battery. Um, yeah, and 5 volts and 5 volts only. Uh, I guess before I continue, any questions on... I should ask either the motor driver or any other stuff related to the course. It's not, no. Okay, uh, the other thing, the, the progress reports were marked, the marks were put online on like Tuesday, I think. Um, the physical, if you handed in physical copies, those were returned to the 3901. Outside of the secretaries, there's little bins where all the assignments are returned. Those are there. If you submit it electronically, uh, I printed off a marking sheet for everyone as well and put it in that same spot, just that has additional details of the mark breakdown. Um, so all that information is outside the secretaries, and that's where all assignments are um, as well. Right. Oops, no questions. I'll move into uh, what I'm covering today. So this is talking about, go back right to the beginning. 
uh, integration and testing. So in particular, what I'm going to be looking at is uh, very briefly debugging, just a reference to that. So I talked about this. This was in a previous lecture. Um, so I'm not going to go over details of debugging techniques. But I will talk about testing plan, built-in self-tests, uh, using the watchdog timer, which you can do on the AVR, and some uh, environmental considerations. I'll mention that. Uh, as well as, more importantly, the common integration uh, problems that you might run into. Um, so debugging, which I covered in lecture number seven, is typically reactive. Uh, so this means you, you realize there's a problem, and then you go about finding what the root cause is and fixing it. Uh, what we're talking about with testing is more about being proactive. So this is taking a system and saying what bugs are in this system, um, or testing that it works as it's intended to. So we might find a bug and then go into debugging mode uh, to actually fix the, the underlying root cause. But we need testing to proactively find these bugs and not find them you know, when we're out in the field using it or the customers find them or stuff like that. Because that's typically a lot more expensive, a lot more of a hassle um, to find them when you're trying to use the system than in a testing environment. So there's a few main types of testing. Uh, so the simplest, or not necessarily simplest, but the most well-defined is unit testing. Uh, so this is testing an individual module or subsystem. Uh, so this could mean, you know, if you have a, a large complex system, you're testing just the sensors. You're testing just the sensor uh, conditioning. You're testing just the analog to digital converter. Um, so it, it, and it can vary, you know, how large these uh, modules or subsystems are, depending on sort of what your, your test plan is and how complex your overall system is. So you might define, uh, if we have a robot, you know, we have a sensor here, an amplifier, and then the uh, MCU, so the microcontroller there. Uh, so you might define, well, one unit is only, you know, part of the analog chain. I'm going to test just that the sensor itself is working as intended and I get an output signal that's, um, you know, say between zero to five volts as I'd like for the ADC. Uh, you might alternatively define a bigger unit that includes part of the microcontroller unit. So you might say, well, my unit test will actually include the sensor, the amplifier, and the, the microcontroller reading the data and printing it to the screen. Um, so that could be a larger, a slightly more complex unit. But it depends really on how you're defining your system. If you're defining your system such that it includes the MCU, your unit test would also include that. Um, once all of the units are tested, you would then look at integration testing. So this, in this testing, we're testing several modules that are integrated together. Uh, it might not be the entire system. So this might just be you know, looking at the sensor, doing the readings, uh, interfacing to the navigation system. Uh, but I'm not testing the whole robot together. I don't have the motors connected or something like that. And when we're doing this, we basically would have test vectors. So we would say, you know, I'm going to put a, uh, an object four meters away from my robot. Based on that, I know that it should take some action uh, or I should see something happen within my program. Uh, so this would be part of the integration testing. Finally, the validation testing is testing the entire system. Um, and this often really focuses on determining that your t system is meeting the performance or requirements you have. Uh, so this would mean, you know, if you have certain specs on how quickly it should be performing actions, if you have specs on output voltages, um, outputs, you know, data speeds, uh, what exactly it should be doing, this would all be things tested in the validation tested. Uh, so what you want to do here is verify that your system, uh, the entire system works as intended. So, you know, testing, there's not so much problem, problems with testing, but complications really. Um, it requires a few things. It requires a good test plan. So this means you need to sit down and think about what are all the things I need to test. Uh, this can be, you know, a fairly complex plan if you really want to test all aspects of your design. Uh, it also requires that you follow the test plan. Um, and finally, it can miss errors that you didn't uh, think about or consider. So if you failed to think about, you know, what's a possible error in the, uh, in the test and put it into the test plan, you might never catch it. Uh, 
if you go into some safety critical applications, this can be very tricky. One example, uh, in automotive, for example, there's requirements that when you're doing testing, you have to be able to test all branches of your software. So every line of code you write has to have been executed as part of the test plan to prove it doesn't crash the car. Um, at some point, you might want to have code that just catches errors. But if you have no way to cause those errors to happen, so if they're very, very rare errors, you have this you know, safety code that says in the worst case, do this, shut down the car. Uh, if you have no way to test it, it's not even allowed to be in the final product uh, because it's not you know, part, of the, part of the test plan. It's not uh, enforced that it, it works as you intend. So this is really tricky because uh, it's code that you would think should be there from an engineering perspective but without having the test plan uh, for compliance purposes, you can't. So there, there is some interesting aspects of testing. Um, and there's lots of examples where lots of testing was done, but it was still able to miss something. So a good example of this, uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter. Uh, this was a probe sent to Mars uh, that basically it was supposed to arrive at Mars in a uh, you know, some distance from the Earth, from the surface of Mars, uh, like 230 kilometers. When it arrived to Mars, what happened is it was much lower than expected, like 60 kilometers off the surface. You can see on the bottom line, and it either burned up or bounced off into space. Uh, so it was a total loss of the entire spacecraft. And the immediate question is, what happened? You know, was there some testing failure? And what they figured out is what happened um, is that. As part of the, the system, there's you know, various um, navigational subsystems, and one of these subsystems was feeding data to another subsystem. Uh, and I believe they were done by either, one was done by a separate contractor from the other system. Um, so the person doing this system had the output in a certain uh, imperial unit set. Uh, so what does it say it was in? It doesn't actually say the units, but it was in, you know, like foot, um, foot pounds, something like that, some imperial unit set. Uh, and what this module was expecting was a metric unit set, so like Newton meters, um, some sort of metric unit. And there was no units on the actual communication set. In this case, it was a file. Um, it was just reading the raw values and assuming what the units were. Uh, so one was in the imperial units, the other was expecting metric units. This caused this large navigational error uh, as it reached the, the planet and the end result being just the loss of the spacecraft because it was in the wrong location. Um, so that's sort of a good example where each individual unit might have worked absolutely perfectly uh, and maybe even some level of integration testing would have been passed. But somewhere along the line they didn't test both of these together and verify the actual performance of them. Uh, that would have caught the error, but that because that wasn't done, it caused the loss of the spacecraft. All right, so talking more about unit testing. Uh, unit testing, as I said, we're testing individual modules. This will really often require what's called a test harness. Um, most of the time, you know, if you have a module here, it doesn't just sit in free space having inputs and outputs. Um, for example, if you have your navigational module, it's going to be reading data from sensors and then giving an output to something like a motor, your motor controller. Um, so if you want to test this unit here, so if I call this unit under test, it's going to require you to um, you know, you don't want to be, have these other modules involved in your test. You want to test just this single module. Uh, so what you would have to do is have what's called a test harness, which is something that replaces these inputs and outputs. Uh, most likely what this is going to be is that you can actually just have a file, you know, and, and the file can have test lines and it can say, we're going to first pretend an object is say one meter away, um, is maybe the input of sensor number one. And the second sensor input can just be a, uh, the switch state, is a switch hit or not. So what we can do is you can actually write down a series of environmental 
and I will say the switch is hit there and let's hit some switch here. So I've just, you know, I have a list of input conditions to the module um, and I would put those through the module and have some expected output and then compare the expected output with the actual output. So this is something you can pretty easily do in just even a, a small C program. So if you want to uh, have very basic unit tests, you could literally hybrid code these and, you know, call the function once, twice, three times, four times, five times each time with a different input and just print f uh, what the output of it is. So that's a really simple way to verify that, hey, does this behave as I was expecting it to behave? Uh, you know, if it senses a wall nearby, is it properly claiming that it's turning away from the wall or something like that? Uh, so this is a way to test it without having to rely on, you know, is it the problem in your motor driver or your sensors or anything like that? Um, oops, so yeah, that's what I talked about. So uh, if we move up the chain, an example of something approaching validation testing. So if you want to test a, a complete product, so this is a board I'm doing, um, and you have a question. So you have a, a large circuit board, and you want to do more than just sort of vaguely test it works. You know, how do you test um, faulty components? So if there's errors in the supply chain, uh, you can have bad soldering, and you can even have things like the incorrect value of components were mounted. So there's some design and, you know, I've specified resistor and capacitor values. Um, how do I verify that it appears all of those values are correct? So when we move up the chain to something like this, testing a hardware product, one thing you can look at doing is um, a test jig. So this example here is from another company, Adafruit. Um, and what they have is they have these pogo pins on the left, you can see. So these are, oops. These pogo pins are these guys here. Um, and the circuit board itself pushes down on the pins and uh, those pogo pins make contact with points on the circuit board. And that, a, this example is using like a connector pins. Uh, you will often see on board special test pads designed just for these. So you'll see these flat pads. Um, and the, the test jig can make contact with that. It's then up to you. So you see all these wires go off somewhere to some other tests whatever the board is under this they're using for testing. Um, so in this example, I have the board under test on the top here. And you can't see it, but there is basically these pogo pins are contacting a number of connector points here. Um, and then you have something like I'm scripting uh, various tools. So there's an oscilloscope in the background here. Um, there's, this is used as a RF signal generator here. Um, and these inputs are wired in through the system. So it's not a, you know, insanely complex thing to build, but with something like this, you can perform that level of validation testing that you need. Um, so the, the levels will depend on your, your product or your project or what you're doing, but something like this, uh, you can use, you know, a scripting language like Python to exercise most of the, most of the system. So in this case, the script uh, downloads programs to the board itself, so it has a programmable microcontroller on it that exercises the digital I.O. Um, it's checking the current consumption, so you can't see it here, but there's a uh, meter off to the side that it reads the values from automatically. Uh, so it's confirming that you know it doesn't appear it's consuming excessive current or too low of current or anything like that. Um, it's testing the, the inputs and outputs. Uh, it checks the analog input, so this is where the, the signal generator is used to send a analog input in. Um, and it checks various other modules and prints, prints a report showing, you know, for example, what's the, what's the responses look like from the board and various uh, parameters. So, so that's an example of something approaching a, um, you know, a simple validation test for a hardware product. The other thing we can look to is, um, oops, that should be built. That built in self test. Um, so, in the previous example, this was you know something that at the manufacturer they run, it runs a very extensive test and verifies everything. Um, but what you might also look to have is a built in self test. So, this is where the equipment itself verifies its own functionality and operation. Um, so, this is convenient to detect failures, you know, before they either to detect failures as they're sort of coming up to affecting the entire system, 
um, or to you know help notify the user what is the problem here, um, things like that. So there's a lot of reasons to have these uh, built-in self-tests. You can have them performed either one time, um, you know, within the power cycle of the device. So this would be known as power on self-test. So when the device first comes up, performs a self-test, and then it doesn't perform it again. Uh, it could be performed on demand, so the user could request, you know, every hour or every day, perform the built-in self-test to verify the functionality. Um, it, you may even have in more reliable systems a continuous self-test, so it's always operating. Um, it's always exercising various subsystems to confirm they're operating properly. Uh, so a lot of consumer goods actually do have some sort of built-in self-test. So uh, when your computer boots, for example, it performs this power on self-test. Um, and depending on what it's doing, you'll see it run through a, uh, normally they skip it now, but they used to always do a full memory check so it would check none of your uh, RAM was bad in your computer uh, or stuff like that. And it'll check, you know, hey, is there hard drives? What's the status of them? Uh, the hard drives themselves have a reporting mechanism that uh, checks for, you know, variations in the drive performance that are indicative of an upcoming failure and notifies you. I, it, ideally, before the drive fails, it tries to tell you, hey, this drive looks like it's going bad. You should replace it. Uh, same thing with, so this is one of the older iPads. Um, you know, you'd get this, you could get this screen. Uh, that we come up and it just had a little frowny face and this was saying the built-in self-test completely failed the system couldn't boot uh, effectively so lots of products have some level of, uh, of built-in self-test like that you'll also see uh, devices themselves often have built-in self-test so this is your mpu uh, 9150 so the device you have um, and it actually has a self-test mode. So you can set a bit that enables self-test mode. And you'll see here it says self-test response. Um, and basically it, in this case, it has this change from factory trim. Uh, so all it's supposed to do is the output should change plus or minus 14%, uh, depending on the polarity of the self-test. Uh, and you'll see the same thing, the, the accelerometer also is a self-test. So when you set the input to a certain state, you expect a certain change um, bias in the output. You can just confirm that, hey, not only is the sensor working, but my interface is working and I'm reading it correctly. Uh, so the idea of the self-test is this shouldn't pass if there was physical damage to the sensor. All right, so uh, moving on from the, the built-in self-test, another thing to talk about is the, uh, the watchdog timer. Uh, so what this is used for is this is a form of sort of hardware failure detection. Uh, the idea being that we have a computer here, and this can be, you know, a microcontroller or anything uh, else. It doesn't have to be a full computer. Uh, there's a, another device called the Watchdog Timer. Uh, and it basically just says if you don't uh, talk to me within a certain time frame, so if you don't talk to me every second, I'm just going to reset you. Uh, so you can see the timeout from the watchdog timer goes to the reset of the computer. So as long as the computer continuously says to the watchdog timer, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, um, it doesn't do anything. As soon as the computer stops doing that, it resets the, the system. So the idea being that uh, if we go into a crash or an infinite loop, uh, the computer will stop talking to the watchdog timer. So obviously this requires you to put some consideration into how you how you do this talking to the watchdog timer because you want to make sure that um, this, if it crashes, this stops functioning. So that the watchdog timer will reset you and you'll recover. Um, there's a few additional considerations if you want to use a watchdog timer in any system, it's not specific to just the AVR. Um, we really want this to be a hard reset, so we want to make sure that. You know, if a computer is in a really crashed state, uh, it's still able to recover. Um, so this often means we need a hardware reset to bring it back to life. We also need the software to gracefully recover. Um, so the problem is this reset is a pretty drastic occurrence uh, and we need the computer to come up and sort of realize this has happened and realize, hey, something went wrong. You know, either I need to store some debug information or possibly do something differently or at least tell the user. Um, 
So if possible, store a debug. And the other thing is that you don't want to rely on the CPU resources. Uh, so in this case, they're talking about the clock, for example. So if this clock itself, a lot of computers have a situation where the clock is controlled by the computer, so the computer can set the clock speed. Uh, the problem with, if you had something like this, what's possible is that if the computer misprograms the clock and kills it, um, this would cause the computer to stop responding, but it would also, in this case, cause the watchdog timer to stop counting. It, it's lost its clock source as well. So you don't want a, uh, the watchdog timer to rely on you know, a resource controlled by the computer. Yeah, so this is what I was saying. You have this problem where the, the microcontroller itself, uh, within the microcontroller, very frequently does have a clock generator that's controlled by the core. Um, and it is possible for the core to mis misconfigure it. It's sort of a common issue. And if it's misconfigured, the clock will stop. So uh, you can imagine this is not good. And you want the watchdog timer to be able to reset the microcontroller so that it, uh, it gets back to the default state where the clock was running again. So the AVR itself does have a built-in watchdog timer. If you look in the data sheet, it's one of, one of its modules right here uh, is the watchdog timer. So I'll talk a little bit about how to, uh, how to use that. Um, so if you look in the data sheet, it, this lists some features of it. So it just says it has this enhanced watchdog timer. Um, so some of its main features, you notice right away it says clock from a separate on-chip oscillator. Uh, so this is really good. It has an entirely separate oscillator dedicated just to the watchdog timer. Um, and we see in this block diagram there's this 128 kilohertz uh, crystal oscillator. Or not crystal, sorry, oscillator on the, on the AVR just integrated inside it. Um, it also has selectable timeout periods. So this is how frequently you have to... Uh, they call it kicking the watchdog timer, so reset the timer to, uh, to prevent it from killing your whole microcontroller. And you can see it ranges from very small 16 milliseconds to 8 seconds. Um, and you can also enable a hardware fuse such that it's always on, so you can never disable the watchdog timer. Um, your, that means your software must right away turn off the watchdog as soon as possible. So here's the, this lists the timeout options for it. So you can see the timeout is basically in seconds. It's somewhat typical, it's not a precision uh, time. So it varies from, at the smallest we have 16 milliseconds. So this would mean uh, you have to reset the watchdog timer less, you know, it must be a smaller period than 16 milliseconds inside your resets, otherwise your microcontroller will reset. So that's a very fast watchdog. Where you might want stuff like that though is if that you were doing, you know, if you're controlling a car, if you were designing a system for automotive um, or something like that, you want if it crashes to reset as soon as possible. You don't have time to, uh, to wait a long time. Uh, if it's some sort of consumer good, you know, you might pick an eight second timeout because it doesn't care. Remember, this is sort of the worst case time between the system crashing and the device reset is what this timeout is effectively. Um, so if you have some consumer good, you know, if it takes eight seconds before it resets, that's probably fine. The real advantage of the longer timeouts is you don't have to send that pulse as often. So you don't have to uh, be as concerned about when is your software running uh, to send that pulse to reset the watchdog timer. So really the, the typical way to do this is to say um, how frequently is our main task running uh, it's within this task, so this code is showing you how you could use the watchdog timer in the AVR. Uh, so there's this watchdog timer enable, and once you set that, it'll now reset the device uh, within 250 milliseconds, for example. So you have to be sort of careful because you have to make sure, you know, once I turn this on, I'm frequently uh, resetting the watchdog timer. Uh, if you're doing this, if you're debugging, you know, if you're playing with this a bit, you could start with a much longer timeout, like eight seconds or four seconds, so you, you can see the watchdog timer running and you have time to, uh, to do things. Um, so you can see within this, I would call, I now have this call to this watchdog timer reset um, macro down here. 
Uh, and so this is resetting the watchdog timer. I, I have to make sure that that is called at least every 250 milliseconds. Uh, typically what we would do is we would consider where we're gonna do the reset uh, and we're just going to add a, a fudge factor. We're gonna figure out how long does this loop take in the worst case um, and we're gonna add a bit of a fudge factor just to account for if we miss you know, some, a few processes running or something like that. Um, and not, you don't want it to be very large. You want to still uh, make sure that you have done a good job of estimating this time. And maybe I'd put a 1.5 to two times increase on that. So, so if this loop was running every 100 milliseconds, I'd probably choose the 200 millisecond or 250 millisecond time it. There is only, remember, there's just these limited uh, steps. So you don't have an infinite selection of, of time outs. Uh, if you need more frequently, so if you wanted to use, you know, if we said, well, we really want to use this 64 millisecond timeout uh, because we want the system to reset as soon as there's an error. Uh, what this would mean is that within some of these submodules, you might need to call the watchdog timer uh, reset. Uh, because then within each of those, it's going to be running much more quickly than the overall module is, is running. As one warning, um, I had something which is how not to not to do this. So sometimes you'll see people get the idea that, well, what we'll do, because we need to make sure we call this watchdog timer reset uh, quite frequently. So what we could do is we could put the watchdog timer reset inside a interrupt, um, and we could set that interrupt up with a timer to just be called every you know 200 milliseconds or so. Uh, and this means that we could, or we could do it really quickly. We could use these small watchdog timer and never have to worry about a problem with the, um, you know, with that watchdog timer reset not being called. Um, the problem here is that what will happen is that this is done in hardware and so will continue to run even if our main software has crashed. Um, so what you're going to end up with is that, you know, in this, this function here, it could have spun into an infinite loop, but it's part of the, uh, the main, so it's just sitting there and not doing any processing at all. But the problem is this interrupt is still going to be active uh, because the interrupts will override the regular execution and your watchdog timer is just going to continue to run. Uh, so you should never do the watchdog timer like this in an interrupt. You really want to make sure uh, it's part of your main processing. And ideally, you want it to be such that, you know, it's, it's even outside of all of your, your function calls there. So in this case, if any of those function calls uh, froze up, it would cause the watchdog timer to execute. Right. Uh, within the AVR, you have a choice of what you do when it executes, when the watchdog timer occurs. Um, so I think by default, it does this... Uh, this system reset mode. Um, so when it times out, it just resets. And that's all you get. Um, oh wait, no, that's maybe the fuse. It's one of these reset ones is default. I don't know which between the two of them. Um, you have two other options. So one of them is actually just an interrupt. Uh, so this doesn't reset the system at all. It just calls a dedicated interrupt. Uh, within this interrupt, you could then, you know, print a message saying like, hey, the watchdog timer kicked. Uh, so that's really, obviously, really useful for debug because you don't have to um, figure out why your system reset and things like that. Uh, you may also want, if you want to use the watchdog timer uh, for other reasons, so for example, sometimes people use it uh, just as a really simple timer. You can set it to, you know, one of these timeouts. Um, it's not very accurate because that 128, uh, kilohertz oscillator the watchdog timer relies on uh, is it varies a lot with temperature and voltage you can check the data sheet uh, but you can nothing stops you from using this as just a you know another timeout uh, system alternatively you could still use the interrupt mode as a regular watchdog but if you don't need the whole reset um, and one of these modes there's also this interrupt then go to system reset uh, mode and so what this is doing is when the watchdog timer kicks it gives you an interrupt uh, So if your system is still somewhat running that interrupt will execute or will execute uh, In that interrupt you could do stuff like if you had a attached disk drive, you know turn off the disk drive sync any last-minute files uh, Save debug log information 
But after that interrupt executes, it's killing your processor. It's going to reset it. Um, so you can't save the system at that point, but it gives you a bit of a chance to possibly um, keep it running. Or not keep it running, keep the, uh, the debug information alive that you might want. But, uh, but even if you don't use that, so even if it just resets, the other thing you should look at is how you can determine the reset source. Um, so the reset source is always written. There's a status, this MCU status register, MCUSR. Uh, within the MCU status register, you have a, it stores a bunch of uh, reset information. Um, so there's a, a power on reset circuit, the brownout uh, reset circuit, the regular reset circuit, uh, and the watchdog timer. So what these various circuits are, are methods of generating a processor, uh, processor reset. Uh, so very briefly, uh, the power on reset is occurring every time the voltage raises, goes from zero to you know, whatever your operating voltage on, there's a power on reset that makes sure your processor comes up in a correct state. Um, there is a external pin the reset pin, so this is on your uh, development board, you have this pin, if you pull it low, it resets the chip. Um, as a note, I think I've sort of mentioned once or twice, the, um, for the competition day, what's going to happen is that on your motor controller board, on your AVR, they're going to connect in, and I have to check, they were supposed to have them ready shortly. Um, they're basically going to plug in a uh, device that's going to hold your microcontroller and reset um, until the two minute heat is ready to start. Once this two minute heat starts, that pin will be released uh, so your microcontroller starts executing code uh, and does its thing. After two minutes, that pin will be brought down, so bringing your microcontroller back into reset. So what this means is basically that on the competition day, you'll always have had that external reset. Um, and finally, we have the, the watchdog timer. Oops. So the watchdog timer is what we care about because that's what told us the, uh, what the reset source was. The, or the reset source due to the watchdog, uh, watchdog timer. Uh, so you can see here that these flags uh, are latched is the one thing. So that once the watchdog timer has occurred, if you don't manually clear that flag, it's always going to be um, set. Yeah, so it sets when a watchdog reset occurs. And it's always going to be set until you power down the microcontroller and power it back up again. Uh, that's the only time that these are all reset back to zero. Um, so Atmel sort of makes a note here that if you want to make use of the reset flag to identify a reset condition, uh, you should read and then reset the MCU status register, which is to say set all those flags back to zero um, as early as possible. So the idea here is that on power up, you could actually check was the last reset caused by a watchdog timer or was it the external pin going lower or high or something like that. Uh, why they have this warning is that if you don't clear the flags right away, what could happen is you could get you know an external interrupt um, and then you get a watchdog timer interrupt and when you, if you finally get around to reading the, uh, the reset register, after both of those have occurred, both the watchdog reset flag would be set and the external reset flag and probably the power on reset flag too because you never cleared it. Um, so if you want to use this, you should you know, copy the value to your own variable early on in the program and then clear the flags. Um, so this can be useful if Again, if you want to use the watchdog timer, to, uh, you can use an LED to set, you know, if you ever detect a watchdog timer uh, reset, then you can set an external LED. And this tells you, hey, we had a reset caused by the watchdog timer timeout. Um, that's probably something that we didn't want. The other useful reset is um, the, the brownout. So there's a system here and you'll see this brownout reset circuit. Um, and what this is doing is that the, the microcontroller actually has a level you can set. So normally it's running off five volts, say. Uh, and you can actually tell it. So in your system, you're running off five volts. The chip itself runs down to like 2.7, possibly 
uh, depending on your, your frequency. But you can say, hey, if I ever fall below, say, 4 volts, I want you to reset me. And this is what's known as the Brownian. See, so the idea is that if the voltage is starting to fall down because of, of power supply issues, let's just reset the processor. Um, so in this case, if we had, you know, this set to 4 volts, and there's a few fixed voltage level settings. I don't remember offhand what, it, what they are. Um, say we had a dip in the power like that. Uh, what would happen is right here, the micro would go into reset, and then it would be let out of reset. And there's a bit of hysteria such that it doesn't um, uh, keep it in reset, you know, or keep oscillating in and off. So we have this, another higher level that it's allowing the, the controller to reset. Uh, but that's what the brownout detector does. So you can, again, use the LED to flag so you can see, like, hey, if we get a brownout reset, that means we had a power supply issue. So um, this, the next section is talking about sort of typical, I think this is all um, other issues when you go to integrate systems. So the washout timer is one useful uh, safety measure to add in. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, integration and then problems when you integrate. Uh, so various between hardware system interfaces, common issues include stuff like the, uh, the input output voltage level. So, you know, you have a five volt microcontroller and you have a 3.3 volt sensor uh, or 1.8 volt. Um, or you have some system can only operate at three volts and another one only at 1.8. Uh, so you have to make sure you have uh, common uh, voltage levels. You might have issues like uh, impedance matching between devices. So if you're uh, doing RF signals, the cables themselves will have various uh, characteristic impedances and they need to be the same between either the cables and the systems or the systems and the cables and the systems themselves. Uh, so this is where you'll often see reference to like a 50 ohm uh, within amplifiers. Uh, you'll have the impedance matching issues if not. Uh, current drawn in rest requirements. So when you first plug in a device, um, it will often have a very large, what's known as an in rest current. So this is when it's charging its internal power supply networks. Uh, and so you need to make sure your power supply is capable of supplying the in rest current as well as the regular operating current. Uh, we might have things like a DC offset and DC blocking. So what this means is that it's not, or it's fairly common when you have an amplifier, um, the amplifier may or may not amplify a DC signal, uh, which is to say what it might have at the input is it might just have a capacitor. Uh, and the idea being that it's, it doesn't care what offset you have put in if it has that uh, DC blocking capacitor. Um, in this case, you know, you could have a signal at two volts, so you have a very small signal, so if I do this, let's say, so here's two volts, um, and I just have a very small signal that I'm amplifying. Uh, if there's a DC block, that won't matter because that DC constant offset will be eliminated. Uh, so this means when I design the system, I can do stuff like have a virtual ground that's pulling that signal up uh, and use the amplifier without issue. If I don't have that DC block, I then have to consider uh, how I'm going to uh, deal with this you know, all have to externally add a DC block before the amplifier. Uh, the other problem can be startup sequencing. Um, so startup sequencing is how we apply power when there's more than one power supply. Um, so the most common, if the sort of general case here is that uh, if we had something, you know, if you had your robot, if you had multiple power supplies, in your case, you really just have one. Uh, what you would want to do so let's draw a little system. If we have logic and we have motor driver, and we have a motor, uh, what you'd want to do is apply uh, power first to the logic system. So let's say this is a five volt logic system. So we'd want to make sure we apply this power first. Once that's up and running, apply power to the motor driver. Uh, if not, the issue is that maybe the motor driver goes, you know, turns one of the motors on because it doesn't have the correct logic inputs. Um, oops. An example of that is uh, I had mentioned earlier this fiber optic gyro LN200, so a very expensive piece of equipment. Uh, 
Um, now, as part of the, basically part of the design of how it uh, can use the accelerometers is that it has a metal mass, um, and to suspend that mass, it uses coils. Oops. Why those are drying. So it has some different coils. Um, the idea being that if you put an electromagnetic force, uh, you could suspend that mass halfway between, um, you know, the coils, and then you can accept, ac or detect acceleration because as you uh, accelerate, you're going to see that mass move a little bit, and so you can adjust the, uh, you know, how it's held in the in between the coils by adjusting the magnetic field. Um, so the problem the company I worked at discovered that wasn't fully documented is there's also going to be stops. That thing can only move so far. Um, if you power it up incorrectly, so the device itself had a few power supplies. I think it had plus 15 volts, minus 15 volts, and plus 5 volts. Uh, so one of these, I think, you know, like the 5 volt was used for logic, and some of those other power supplies were used to drive these magnetic coils. Uh, and what would happen is if you did the sequence incorrectly, it would turn on one of these coils full strength uh, without the other one being on and this piece of metal here would smack into it would just hit itself into one of these stops and just stick there uh, it did it with enough force that it just embedded it in it uh, and it would basically destroy the, the jagger at that point so you'd have to send it back and for you know I don't know it's like ten thousand dollars they'd fix it or something like that um, so the power supply sequence can be very critical for some systems, and you sort of have to look at the, normally the manufacturers will tell you, hopefully, if you'll damage it. So in this example, I pulled from uh, some test specification here saying, and they have this big warning because they probably found this out as well, um, you know, on power up the plus 5 volt and the minus 15 volt always has to be at the specified level before the plus 15 volt is applied. So if you apply the plus 15 first, uh, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get into the situation where it'll physically destroy itself. Um, so yeah, so in this case, what you need is you need an external system that guarantees this guy is powering up correctly. Um, so that's sort of one of the, the considerations you might run into. The other issue um, you'll have is what's called grounding. So if we have two pieces of hardware, you know, we're going to connect them together. Uh, one of the things we'll have is a ground connection, uh, which seems really innocent and simple, but there's a lot of problems that can occur with this ground. So it first, it requires us to ask what is ground or what's zero volt potential. Um, so you have to remember ground is really just a reference voltage. There's nothing magical about ground. Uh, you know, that's why these guys here, that th these are people doing service on high voltage wires. So they can be at, you know, like 200 kilovolts and well above that. Um, and they were sitting on the wire perfectly safe, relatively safe, I guess, um, from a helicopter. And that's because there's no potential voltage. Even though there's 200 kilovolts between that wire and ground, um, between you know the helicopter mainframe and that wire there's zero volts and between this guy and that wire there's zero volts so they don't care that it's 200 kilovolts that's completely irrelevant to them effectively um, you could consider that the helicopter itself is sitting at zero volts now and the ground is sitting at minus 200 kilovolts uh, that would be just you know the or the physical ground. So if we were calling this the electrical ground, the physical ground would be minus 200 kilovolts. Um, so ground is really just this zero volt reference, this reference point. And when we consider it this way, it helps us uh, look a little more at circuit analysis um, in dealing with grounding. So one example here is this was a uh, what's known as ground loops can be a big problem. Uh, so say we have this situation. These are two, you know, sensitive devices. Number one and number two. Um, and they're plugged into your power supply, so they're plugged into your AC socket. Uh, and these, this, these sensitive devices have metal shields in them, these boxes. Um, and to send data between the two devices, they have a, a cable, 
Uh, a shielded cable so the ground is connected and the second device also has a metal box and for safety that metal box is connected to earth. Um, and now all of these earths basically connect together in your house wiring system. But what could happen, so we have here these earth, earth wiring system. Um, so what can happen is we have another device, it's a big electric motor or something. Oops. And it's actually, uh, it has a small fault and it's putting the ground current down. So it's um, actually passing current through the ground wire, which maybe it shouldn't be. Um, and what we're going to happen is if we consider, uh, if we consider the return path of this current, what you can find out is that some of this current, it doesn't really care where it's going. You know, if you think about it, you say, well, well, all, all I really would expect is, you know, there's current coming down and it goes straight to ground and that's it. Um, but what could happen is some of this current will actually go through the shield to return to ground. So we could have a lot of aspects where we have this unintended current flow and this is going to contribute greatly to noise in these systems because we now have a voltage difference um, at the ground potential between these systems uh, and, the, and current flowing through that, what should be just a shield should be no current flowing through it. Um, so you can get into all sorts of issues when you have ground connected at multiple points like this. Uh, and this is where you'll, you'll see ground loops used as a reference. Um, as sort of another example, if we looked at an audio amplifier, so this might be a little closer to something you'd have in your robots, is um, we have a sensitive device, so we have a microphone here, um, and you can see the input of this microphone is going to go to the amplifier, uh, like this, and the, the microphone, so what the amplifier sees is the voltage, you know, what we want it to see is the voltage across this microphone right here. Um, but that's not what it's reading. What it's reading is the voltage from this point here to the ground. Now in theory, it's the same thing. When we look at this diagram, that ground point is directly connected to that microphone. There should be no issues. Um, in reality, what's happening is that, you know, it's also driving current through this speaker. Uh, so current goes through the speaker and all current always has to have a return path to ground Oops. and really back to the amplifier because that's doing the driving. Um, but what we care about is, you know, this fairly high current, relatively high current, um, is flowing through the speaker and also flowing through this ground. And if this portion of the circuit there that I've highlighted it's a real, say it's a wire, that has a very small but finite amount of resistance. Uh, what this means is that we're going to get a very small but a finite and a, a existing, a real uh, voltage across these two points here because remember voltage is current times resistance. So if there's a little bit of resistance and a little bit of current, we do get a little bit of voltage there. Um, so what this means is now when we look at our circuit, uh, the, the microphone, you know, what we were considering we're trying to read the voltage across the microphone, but we're really reading the voltage difference between the input to the amplifier and that ground point. Um, and so what's gonna happen now is that there's a small voltage difference uh, between the ground point and the negative of the microphone. That's gonna give us noise uh, in, the, in the amplifier, possibly feedback in this exact uh, circuit here but it's something we don't want, so we want to eliminate that. So to eliminate that, uh, a lot of circuits in the sort of medium frequency range, so audio frequency range, use this star grounding technique. Uh, so you can see here what we have is all of the grounds come back to a common point and are connected, you know, at a star. Um, and the idea here is that now, if we looked at how our current would flow, we'd have current flow here. Um, there's going to be a, you know, a small voltage developed across this wire again, um, but it doesn't affect our microphone ground. Our microphone ground comes back separately, uh, and everything is referenced to this point here. So the voltage drop generated across the, um, 
the speaker ground isn't affecting our microphone ground, isn't contributing to noise. Uh, so the stir grinding technique can be very useful to reduce noise, especially, you have to remember, it, it, what it's reducing is this uh, potential voltage, um, the voltage generated by that ground voltage here. So it depends on, you know, how if you have a lot of amplification in your system, it'll be more sensitive, obviously, to those small voltages. Or if you're driving a big load, like a motor or a speaker, you'll have this issue. Uh, so if you look on, especially on audio products, they have love the star grinding so you'll see for example there's this big huge pad here and you can see all of these pads are coming back to it um, and so they're doing this to improve the um, to sort of eliminate any potential problem here so they've just split out everything into its own ground path um, and you know like here's a board that takes it to the absolute extreme of looks like a squid or something uh, but you can see like there's this one ground and then it's brought almost every ground point back to that. Uh, stuff like this, it varies. It's not a fix all um, because obviously now these traces have a lot more uh, inductance and if they were passing a large current, I had reduced current handling capability because you have a smaller trace running a greater distance. Um, so it depends a lot on the specific design if it, this is lower frequency, so this is all audio frequency stuff, that shouldn't be nearly as big an issue. Uh, if you were looking at higher frequency or digital circuit boards, you couldn't do this. You would rather have a solid uh, ground plane to reduce the inductance um, of these, these pads. You don't care as much about the, you know, that the grounding issues for the digital board are basically not as big a deal here. You're more concerned about keeping the inductance down um, for faster power delivery in a digital board. Oops. But what you will see, so if you combine digital and analog boards, uh, what you'll often see is what's known as a split ground plane. So this here is a ground. Um, and what the designer here has done is what they're showing is that rather than um, you know rather than risk so what we were talking about here is where we develop a voltage uh, to help isolate any noise in the ground paths they were actually splitting the circuit board planes um, and so you can see there's these gaps here the idea being that if there's uh, in the digital section, so it doesn't show any chips in the digital section, but let's say there's a few chips here. Um, some random chips. Uh, so if we have various signals um, that are running along here and wherever, there's going to be a current flow in the ground at those points. Uh, the idea is that by splitting the planes, we're ensuring the current or making it more likely the current stays away from the analog section of the board and it shouldn't produce any voltage drops. The one huge caveat here is that you cannot cross a split over any of the layers. So the problem being that um, if I took a trace and routed it like this, um, what's gonna happen is that if this is the, the signal trace, every signal needs a return Um, and I have these splits here where really, the return current cannot flow. Um, so basically the return current is going to try to flow right under the, the trace, which is good. So this, I've drawn an offset a bit, but when it gets to this split, it's going to have a huge problem now because now that current can no longer flow directly under it. So it's got to loop around, um, probably loop back there and same thing. So it, it's going to have these huge, and in that case, it can't even reach around, so it's going to be going underneath it and stuff like that. Um, so the problem is that the, these current loops are going to be pushing further and further away from the signal, which gives us uh, more interference than if it was right under the signal. So there's some trade-offs between using a split plane and just using one continuous solid plane for these types of circuits. Uh, as an extreme example of this, this was a a board I had looked at before that was having issues. And uh, what happened is that 
the designers of the cigar board uh, wanted, they needed some low noise sections here. Um, so this was supposed to be the low noise section. And then this was the digital section. Um, and you can see they made this big split in the ground plane. So I'll draw it in green maybe. So in green here, they had a split in the ground. And the only connection was a, uh, an inductor way up here. Uh, the problem was they routed some high-speed digital traces across that split, uh, which, again, when you have the split, you have to be very, very careful not to do that. Um, because what happened is that the return current for the digital traces in red had to flow, like I have it highlighted in blue, it went way up and around um, and down to return to the chip. And if you measure the voltage, so here I have a scope probe connected to these two points, you know, it doesn't matter. So I'm measuring the voltage on what should be ground. So it should be, you know, the same voltage potential um, and plotted it up here. You saw this huge waveform. And this waveform was the clock. One of the pins writing was a clock. And um, you can see it's like 100 millivolts per division. So it was, I don't know if you can quite see. So it's like a 500 millivolt peak to peak. Um, waveform, which is not good when it should be at the same potential. Um, and that's what happens if you do stuff like that, you're trying to use a split plane and then route traces across them. Uh, so the split plane can be useful, but um, you have to be very careful uh, in some situations when you're using it. All right, so that's sort of all the material for today. Uh, basically, I'm hoping it gives you an idea of when you're moving forward to testing your robot, uh, some of the ideas on, you know, just doing tests on individual units, how you can maybe integrate them. Um, and it is useful, even if it's an informal test plan, to consider how you might do it. Uh, so going back to the idea of unit testing. Somewhere. Um, you know, you can make this test harness. Don't consider it that you have to have this large, complicated test plan. Uh, if you want, just to get an idea about testing, to you know, do stuff like testing your motor driver, verifying each of the directions worked. Um, testing if you have a module doing navigation or something to just make a, uh, a separate function that inputs a bunch of different numbers to the navigation module and verifies the output of it. Um, so you can do some, some simple unit tests with just the Atmel Studio making another subroutine. Um, and without getting too crazy. So that's, I think that was all conclusions. Let's just check. Yeah, and it'll help you. It then gives you something if you need to do debugging to know where possible problems are. Um, yeah, any questions on any of that stuff or other? All right, that's it.